Good afternoon and welcome back to another episode of Have Game Will Travel. I'm your host, Bennett Newsom. I'm the esports strategist here at Full Sail University. Uh, but most of you probably know me on the internet as Dammit Bennett. Uh, if this is your first time joining us, welcome. And if you've watched before, we're happy to have you back. Have Game Will Travel is an interview style show that focuses on how there's so much more to the world of esports and gaming than just being good at the game. So uh, today we're going to take a virtual trip on uh, with our guests through their journey in the industry. If you do have any questions, uh, make sure you type them in the chat at any time. We'll pull them up on screen and get them answered for you. Uh, so, uh, you know, buckle up. Have Game Will Travel uh, starts uh, right now. All right. Can you go ahead and just talk for me real quick, just so I make sure that we can hear you? Hello, hello. Perfect. Let's uh, go. This is Cora. Can I go ahead and introduce yourself and tell all the people what you do and, and everything? Yeah. So, hi, I'm Cora Kennedy. I am the director of esports at Illinois Wesleyan University. Um, prior to coming to Wesleyan in 2021, I was a high school math teacher for three years. I taught math and computer science. There, I also founded and ran the Glenwood High School esports program for three years. I founded that my second day of teaching. And then I also got involved in and I'm a director for the Illinois High School Esports Association, which uh, which I was the director, TO, caster, producer, and moderator, and whatever the hell else they want me to do <laughs> uh, for three years for like 28 tournaments. And then actually a new thing is going to be announced probably in five minutes. Uh, I am now a board member for the Voice of Intercollegiate Esports. Awesome. Well, congratulations on that. I think I, the thing I love about working in collegiate esports is there's so many hats that you get to wear, you know? And, and Oh, yeah, there is. <laughs> one day you're doing that, and it just continues, uh, which is a lot of fun. But uh, So tell me, how did you get into gaming? So it's actually for my dad. My dad is a huge gamer. Uh, he has a Doom mouse pad from the original Doom. Yes. For, like, like, it's that old. He, he's <laughs> an IT director and a coder, and he, I grew up with PCs all over yeah. my house. Um, I can scrap build PCs from the graveyard in his basement. And so I grew up with gaming, but it's a lot of console gaming. He got mm -hmm. me started in gaming early. I played a lot of Pokemon as a kid, Game Boy Color. I had PlayStation. I made the username Rogue from my Xbox 360. Yeah. <laughs> when the 360 launched, I went by Rogue Leader for till like last year. Okay. And then I made, I went to Rogue because it's easier. And I just followed gaming. And then when I went to college, I, I played games all through high school. I competed in a competitive Black Ops 2 clan in high school. Um, and then when I went to college in 2014, I got super interested in Counter-Strike because I had my first gaming capable computer, some gaming laptop, which yeah. was nice. And I then proceeded to watch and play a frankly concerning amount of Counter-Strike. Um, I kept up with the tier one, two, and three scene for North America, EU, CIS, Brazil, LATAM, Turkey, Japan, China, Australia, Southeast Asia, and I'm missing one. Wow. And so what happened is any given time, I'd walk across quad, I'd have my earbuds playing some match. If I was doing homework at my desk, I'd have my second monitor playing yeah. some match. If I was playing Counter-Strike, I'd be playing some match. And then it just got so obsessed that my friends introduced me to League, and that's my life went downhill. And then, <laughs> and then it got worse because they introduced me to, to R6. Right. And then I competed in R6 for about a year um, and played that for a while and then came to high school and started doing teaching and then esports there. Okay, cool. So, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think that having that influence from your from your dad and in the whole world of technology and gaming is huge. Um, we have this question on the show that we always ask, and, and that is, um, what was the first game that you ever loved? And I, I, had, I kind of share like a similar story. My parents were into gaming when I was young. They had like an Atari and everything like that. And uh, my dad bought me and my mom and dad bought me a uh, 32X and it came with Doom. And like that changed everything. <laughs> like I was like the first game I ever fell in love with, played nonstop, and made sure to, I mean, at that point, it wasn't necessarily like an achievement hunting or anything like that, but it was it's one just, of those things. Just, I want to play this constantly and do everything. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So for yourself, I mean, obviously you mentioned a couple games there. What was the first game that you truly fell in love with? Actually, none of those. Okay. Um. So I loved Pokemon as a kid, but I wasn't like super invested in it. I just it was a cool thing to play as a kid. And I had all these games on GameCube and PlayStation I loved, but they weren't like obsessive life thoughts. For me, it was Mass Effect 2. Oh, okay, yeah. Mass Effect 2, I have 100 percent it four times. Uh, and then Mass Effect Legendary is, again, I have 100 percent Mass Effect 2 on Mass Effect Legendary when it came out on PC. Um, I had that game straight memorized. 
and I it, it, it kicked off this huge love of science fiction for me. Yeah. And like sci-fi stuff, I'm running a sci-fi novel now because of Mass Effect and just cool things that I love from Mass Effect. And it's given me so many cool ideas. And I have a novel collection behind me you can't see off camera <laughs> that's almost entirely science fiction. That's awesome. My, my dad was like, what do you want for Christmas? Like, I want books. And they just be <laughs> science fiction books. And so like Mass Effect was just the first one for me. That's great because I mean, what what a game! And and I think the uh, the community, especially like on platforms like Twitch, you know, is huge for Mass Effect. Me two was yep. amazing. Yep. <laughs> um, so was gaming truly your first passion, or is this something that kind of went in a new direction for you? Um, my friends keep calling me out for doing a lot of things at once, and as a kid, <laughs> I was the same way. I played five sports as a kid. Okay. And I also was in Scouts. I'm an Eagle Scout. Uh, I also did gaming. Uh, I was also doing music. I made state four times. Like I did everything. And so I didn't have time to sit down and say, this is my one thing because that time just didn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> but when I hit college, something kind of clicked and I was involved on a couple products in college, but also mainly gaming. Yeah. And I found a lot of community through esports. and my core group of friends that I'm, I love them all to death is through gaming. And I know all of them by randomly meeting someone at freshman orientation who's like, hey, you're from the same hometown. Hey, you play video games? Mm -hmm. Hell yeah, I do. We best friends now? Hell yeah, we are. And that was it. <laughs> and, that, and that was literally it. And now we're all best friends together. And I I, I love them all to death. Yeah, and so that's just where it's come from. It's it's incredible, like, the bonds that can be made uh, through gaming. You know, I, I'm a streamer as well. And, you know, playing with people across the world, like, having friends that live in completely different countries. And it's and kind they, of on site too. It's like, hey, you play this game? Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. And then we just go from there. Exactly. That's awesome. So talk. let's talk about college a little bit. You graduated from Illinois State University. Is that correct? Yes. So awesome. I went to Illinois State from 2014 to 2018. I have a degree in mathematics teacher education, which is high school math teacher. And then I have a secondary or a minor in technology and engineering education. Perfect. And you feel like uh, getting that education helped you later in your career as far as esports is concerned um the education so the weird part about a teacher degree is that the degree teaches you basically nothing i i i basically have a full math degree and, and had some teacher experience i learned the most through student teaching and then my actual teaching yeah. experience and i always tell my friends this that teaching changed me as a person okay but in a good in a good way in a good yeah. way um what it did is it really showed me how much i'm a student-centered and person-centered person because going into education and leaving college i had this view that oh i like doing math teacher because i like math well no not really <laughs> what really motivated me like yes i love math yes i'm published in math i'm a giant nerd i have an infinity sign tattooed my arm yeah i love it but like the reason that i really got in teaching is because i love the kids yeah and it's the students and i've carried that student first mentality with me um I have the nickname esports mom, my discord, because it's really the truth. I am that motherly figure for a lot of kids. Yeah. And I, I just genuinely care about so many people and I want them to know it. And that's incredible. It's such a huge part of, you know, the collegiate esports space is, is the students, you know, and, and, and supporting them and providing for them. So that that's fantastic. And this isn't a question, but I'm going to pull it up anyways, because, <laughs> uh, you know, it's a little shout out to you. And, uh, you know, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta give, give the love where it is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I know who that is. Thank you so much, honey. I appreciate it. I appreciate this so much. So you mentioned this early, you, through student teaching, you, you did tutor, um, for several subjects when you were in college. Um, yeah. Prior to that, and I guess even going in and, and majoring, was education just something that you, hey, I, I know that I want to be a teacher, that I have a passion for? Or did somewhere along the line that kind of push you into that direction? So my parents both were career-focused people. My mm -hmm. parents are both first-generation college students, and they both came from very extreme abject poverty. So they put a lot of heavy emphasis on education. Yeah. Well, as I'm going through school around sophomore year, dad kind of stopped me and said, like, hey, your job right now, because you don't have a job. We're not going to make you a summer right. job or anything. Your job is to get into college which I was okay with because I had a lot of very academic interests. So I wasn't like, oh, I want to be a welder. No, <laughs> I mean, I've done it before and I'll explain it later. Yeah. Uh, but like, it's, it was really just focused on college. And so he's like, what do you want to do? I'm like, I don't know. 
because every kid is, I want to be a fireman. I want to be an astronaut. Right. But, but I had I never had the serious thought of what I want to do. And around that time, I was working scout summer camps. So scouting, I, so I, I am transgender. I am she, her. And, but scouting was a huge part of my past. I right. worked at scout camps for three, four years. I attended them for 10. And a lot of my experience this summer is centered around camp. Okay. And I found this love of teaching through what I was doing at scout camps. Yeah. Now I was teaching how to shoot guns, which was cool. <laughs> right. But I found this love of teaching. And when I came back from my junior year of high school, after that one summer working at camp, I had a teacher who was fresh out of college in my math class, in my pre-calc class junior year. He was fresh to college and he connected with me a lot. And a lot of my teaching style and what I do comes from him. So Mr. Riddle really influenced me and just showed me that like education isn't this dry, boring thing of everyone just being grumpy and here's the content, go learn it. It's a lot of fun. And he inspired me to be a teacher. And I had this thought of like, I want to be a teacher, but I don't really know what subject. Because right. I liked history. I liked math. I hated English. Uh, <laughs> Same. <laughs> the thing is, exactly. The thing is, I found a love of math through Mr. Riddle and I decided I want to teach it. And then... Uh, my department chair at my high school liked me for some reason and let me student teach my senior year of high school. Oh, that's awesome. And so I was mentoring and tutoring in class and helping a freshman algebra class in high school. And it gave me this really cool experience that I reflect back on upon, upon fondly. Yeah. I think it's really important too. I mean, the, the, the impact that that teacher had on your life and your career, even for that. It, it's I such... have come back to tell him that too. Good, good. Yeah. I was going to say, it's such a, it's such an incredible thing. Um, and, and how, you know, working with students is, is super impactful because sometimes all it takes is just someone paying attention, you know, and yeah. caring a little bit about them. And, and that goes such a long way. And, and I'm sure you see that now in, in the collegiate space as well. But um, yeah, after college, obviously you said you went and you taught high school math and computer mm -hmm. science mm -hmm. uh, for what, three years. And yep. then um, I guess during that time, so you're in high school, you're teaching high school math and, and computer science. Did you find that students were interested in like the competitive aspect of gaming or were they just interested in gaming? So here's the weird thing. Um, I made the team and they just kind of came to me. So okay. I founded the team having never seen a single student yet. I started the team my second day of new teacher orientation before the school year. Yeah. And I just talked to my principal who's like, this guy seems cool. So second day I'm like, <laughs> hey, can I do gaming as a club? He goes, sure. Can I compete in it? Sure. Can I get jerseys and funding? No. And, and, <laughs> and, then, part, right? <laughs> and then I went from there. And what happens is I'm actually really lucky. So my entire first year League of Legends team. So my first year I operated only League and Overwatch. Okay. That's all that the IHSA offered because I wanted to be in a league. My, my administrators rule because my first year I was owned by owned. I was owned by the club side of, of the, mm -hmm. the, the school. And then my second and third year I was owned by athletics. Uh, but the first year I was told you need to play an organized league. You can't just find some random one offs online. Cause like, yeah. cause high school star league existed, play yep. versus existed. Um, Nasef hadn't even got off the ground yet. And so I had to go play IHSK and I got contacts through there and I made a lot of friends there and I'm in charge of it now. So, or the, one of the directors. So it's, yep. it, it kind of worked, but I had to find this league and I'm very lucky that my first year league team were five seniors who were all best friends who've been playing league for five years. That's awesome. So I'd have to coach squat on communication yeah. or teamwork. <laughs> I had to tell easy. them actually to, I had to tell them to talk more actually because they wouldn't talk at all. <laughs> We'd have like so we had a huge bad habit of my bot lane were best friends for life. They wouldn't just not say a single word and win a team fight. And I'm like, okay, I appreciate it. But please say something. <laughs> say something. And, and so I basically they were all in my study hall. I didn't have a single one of them in class. They were all in my study hall class. And I, I mentioned offhand, like, hey guys, starting a gaming team. Can I join? Holy yeah. shit. And then we had that. And then um, I also had like three or four players in my in my class who were on the Overwatch team. And I found players and found friends and they brought their friends in. And it was a really tight knit group that first year. But the kids were interested in competition right away. A couple of them were like super high ranked players. Um, one of them, Logan, who I will call it here, followed me to Wesleyan. <laughs> I had him on the Overwatch team for three years. He was my ringer for three years. Oh, that's awesome. I had teams planning around Logan in particular. And he was 4.1 K peak DPS. He is good. And, and then he came to Wesleyan with me too. But um, he was the reason Overwatch kept together because he was good. 
Yeah. And he and everyone around him competed to be like him. I, I think it goes a long way when you have a, a teammate that's a, a great player, but also brings all the other pieces to the you know the puzzle along with it. Uh, a lot of people are attracted to that. They want to be near that. They want to learn. And they he was grow, such a you know? quiet kid too. Really? He was endearingly quiet. He wouldn't say anything unless he was swearing most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, he had this this aura about him and this personality that made him just so friendly. Yeah. Okay, so you mentioned this, and and I and I want to stop on it because I think it's important. The Illinois High School Esports Association. Yes. Right. The I H S E A. Right. Yes. Uh, tell us about that and 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 kind of explain that a little bit in, in more depth. Do you want the short version or the long version? Uh, whatever the best version is. Okay, so the Illinois High School Esports Association was founded in 2017 and has expanded to a league of 2,300 students. We offer six titles. We uh, have six separate competitive seasons. We've offered state championship trophies and lands for every tournament since 2018. That's incredible. Minus the COVID seasons. Yep. Um, yep. We form an alliance and actually educate coaches as well on how to start their programs. Uh, the, the league currently exists with around 120 programs. Uh, I served as the... I founded IHSC Rocket League in 2019 to 2020. I founded IHSCA Valorant in 2020 to 2021. Uh, I ran a tournament for Valorant the second week the game was out. Yep. And I made a rule set from scratch that was pretty damn close to the actual pro rule set. Right, yeah. Because <laughs> I played a lot of Counter-Strike and watched a lot of Counter-Strike. And so I stole, borrowed, modified some rules. <laughs> um, and... I was also the head TO for League of Legends for years. I TO'd Overwatch knowing nothing about the game. I cast at Overwatch, Rocket League, Smash, uh, Valorant, Fortnite occasionally, um, League a lot. I solo casted. I did production. I, mo I currently am the head moderator. I manage student interns. I'm managing our moderator interns currently to get that program off the ground. And I'm also a nonprofit director. The IHSCA has this massive network of students and coaches who have found community through each other. Yeah. Because what I like is that I like that I have to need student moderators. I like the channels aren't dead yeah. because a lot of leagues that I've, I've been in, a lot of college leagues, especially what you, what you have is I'm in that server to get rules and to get schedules. Yep. I'm in there for nothing else. Well, the IHSA is different because we are in there for the express purpose of chatting with others yeah. and the kids find community through just talking with each other. Um, shout out to the Valorant chat for being always lively and calling me out when a new skin bundle comes out and seeing if I bought it yet. I, I, I literally had one of our student casters roast me on air for buying a new bundle every time a new one came out. Mm -hmm, and I'm like, mm -hmm. Anthony, I don't need this man. Like, please don't do this to me. But the iTrustGA is a huge core part of developing me as an esports person. Yep. I wouldn't have my Wesleyan job without really my experience and what I've done with the IHSCA. And I'm not alone in it. Our executive director, Andy, is amazing. And he was the person who did a lot of our streams and socials. Uh, Todd, the former executive director, brought me in when I was literally brand new. So I started my high school team in September 2018. I joined the IHSCA on the recommendation of Ed Can over at Oswego High School in December 2018. I had three months under my belt and had not even competed yet. We used to run only spring seasons. Okay. I had not even competed. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> and he invited me in. That's cool. And and then I just kept raising my hand for things until he made me stop. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great that, way to get in there, though. It's like volunteer for everything, you know? Yes. Yes. Um, it's become a meme now that whenever we ask for like, hey, can volunteers come up for this thing? I literally have the executive director DM me. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, so, okay, so you, you started this, you've been a part of it for a while now, um, and I think we'll we'll come back to it when we start talking about your, your current career, what you're doing, um, but you're still interactive with uh, the IHSCA, yes. right? Okay, cool. Yes, awesome. so when I left teaching, I looked at what I needed for Wesleyan, and when I leave, left teaching, I was putting in 80 hours a week for work, which is education, plus my own team for 20 hours a week, plus IHSCA. And when we're in season, I would lose, I wouldn't have a free night till usually Sunday nights. Okay. Which kind of killed me. Yeah. And so I told the executive director, Andy, like, hey man, I I will hop into cast here and there. I am not TOing. I just can't. Yeah. Except I still kind of did because I helped with the Valorant rule set again this year. And I was a lot of kids knew me as a Valorant person. Right. And so they'd ask me, like, they they DM me random questions or like, hey, is this person allowed? Or can I do this thing? Or and I was kind of an assistant TO for that this year. 
Uh, and I've also, I casted a bunch this year still for Rocket League and for Valorant. I was the person who ran the students for that, but I wasn't TOing. And as we look to next year, we're adding, we're adding double our staff at least. Okay, for the next cool. year. Yeah. So we're looking to actually put hard lines and roles and not have us wear 10 hats at once. Yes. <laughs> so what I'm doing is I am going to be solely, and I say solely, the head moderator, because I kind of already am. I'm the only staff member who chats that in the discords routinely because part of my job is being on discord. Right. So it's just natural. And then all the kids like me, so I just keep talking to them. <laughs> and then I'm also the head of interns okay. because I once again know all the kids and work with yeah. them and all the kids who'd want to be interns are kind of my kids. Okay. I'm going to use the term my kids loosely throughout this. <laughs> they're not my students, but they're kind of my students. Right. Um, you feel I, like some sort of bond. Over. Well, well, even before I came out, but especially after I come out, I've become this beacon for a lot of students as the only adult who's like them yeah, or who will talk to them in a way that they understand. And so I have become esports mom and yep. the kids, the kids see me as such. And so I have this literal fan club. Um, my friends keep saying, how many cults do you have now? Cause I have several, <laughs> I have several, I have the IHSA. Uh, yeah, I have yeah. a bunch of, a couple of Wesleyan kids. I have my old high school students. I have a bunch of camp kids from last week. And I just, I keep developing these, these groups yeah. and because I'm just trying to be as genuine as I can with the kids. And so the role of moderator and interns just fell naturally because all the kids who'd want to do it already know me. Yeah. And you, you just mentioned after coming out, obviously in October of 2021, you made a pretty big announcement uh, on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I came out as transgender uh, October 16th, 2021. Um, my timeline for coming out is comical to other trans folks because I speed ran. Okay. Um, <laughs> So I, my, my best friend in the world came out to me in like March, April, 2021. And then that kind of kicked some thoughts off for me. Yeah. And I'm like, crap, is that me too? And, and, then, and then, so I figured it out and kind of like started telling my friends in like September of 2021. And then I came out publicly yes. in October. And then I started doing treatments and medical things in, September, in November. Yeah. And so like, I have speed run this. For many people, it's like, oh, I came up to one friend in in three years ago and just told my other friends now. Yeah. I am bad at keeping my own secrets. <laughs> well, so you know, I'll be honest. I, I love your story because you have been very public about it. And I think it, it's helped a lot of people, um, you know, especially in the esports scene to to understand uh, for one or, or like you said, have an, another effect on it. You know, yeah. you have, I jokingly public. call myself the loud gay person on Twitter <laughs> <laughs> because I kind of am, I am this huge advocate and I advocate for my kids, especially mm -hmm. um, what I love. And what I found is I did a lot of speaking engagements throughout the course of the spring semester. Yep. And what happens is whenever I was doing speaking engagements, I get DM by a director, some director randomly in the nation ran afterwards saying, Hey, I have a student who's identifies as such and such. And they could really use talk to someone yeah. else who's like them. Could you talk to them? And so those kids are kids who I consider my own at this point. Yeah. Um, a bunch of them call me mom and I, I, I love them so much. And so it's, it's really nice that I can be that, that resource yeah. for others and show how much I genuinely care about others and help students who I care about because these kids mean the world to me. And I want them to see that someone cares about them because the biggest fear for them when they come out is, Oh, I'm going to be blacklisted. I'm going to be kicked out. Yeah. And yeah. for a couple of them, I know they will be. And, and so for them, I'm the only adult who's accepting of them right now besides their, their esports director and their esports director is someone who doesn't quite understand. And, and so I, I make myself available because the kids need someone and I'm happy to be that someone. That's huge too. I mean, in, you know, Shout out to the other esports director for, you know, noticing and hey, I'm gonna go talk to Cora because this is this is huge. This is something yeah. that this this student needs, and and that's um, you know uh, amazing. Obviously, you, you've dedicated a lot of your time now to DEI uh, work and and yeah. focusing on the LGBTQ plus community in esports. Yeah, uh, can you tell us a little bit about some of the things that you've been doing? So. Once again, speaking on panels nonstop and talking about my experiences and just be like part of what's helped a lot of people is just being visible. Yeah. 
I've had a couple people now DM me saying, hey, I don't need anything for you, but I want to say thank you. Just being visible because you show me that someone else needs space that I can. Because I, to my knowledge, was the first trans director in collegiate. Yeah. And so it's important that that representation. And what I'm also showing for a lot of trans folks is that it's okay to be imperfect. It's okay to not be, because a lot of these people have this idea of like, I need to be perfect at all times. I'm being judged. I'm being judged at all times. I get death threats a lot, but I'm still me. And I'm still being me as much as I possibly can. And that's left an impact on others. And I'm just grateful that I, I'm allowed to be me. I'm grateful I've had all the support I've had. I found a huge community of friends and supporters through collegiate who some of my best friends are just students from other schools. Yeah. And yeah, they're students, but we have this shared experience. And I, and while I looked up to them initially, they look up to me now because I'm, I'm that figure for them. I'm that inspiration. I am being myself as much as I can. I did my 24 hour stream for pride month yep. uh, on the 10th to the 11th of June. I did a 24 hour stream with, Oh God, 28 people involved. 30. Yeah, I saw that. I went uh, back and watched it. It was incredible. <laughs> I had like 30 people involved yeah. <laughs> uh, and I had three sponsors. I had sponsors for my stream. That's I made awesome. this up two weeks prior. Yep. I had shout out to supernova. Shout out to NECC. Shout out to IHSA. Um, I am really good friends with the supernova head of DEI. I'm really good friends with the NECC head of DEI, which by the way, I do DEI for NECC now. Uh, nice. I am part of the IHSEA. I, I, I raised $900 for that stream and donated it all to the Trevor project, which if you don't know is a, is a really valuable charity for those who are watching the Trevor project is a charity that does suicide prevention in LGBTQ youth. It's essentially a suicide hotline for queer youth. And it's really important. The message is really important to me because even as a teacher, I had students and one of them, I consider my son at this point, who came up to me as trans and I was the only adult they talked to. And what this kid would do is he would come to my class every single day, at least three or four times a day, just talk, hang out, talk about life, get some math help too because I was a teacher um and also give me like cute notes and doodles and I've every note that he gave me I have saved because they meant so much to me and and so it's being that representation but also raising money and advocating for others and creating safe communities has really been something really important to me and I am doing that DEI work focused on LGBT LGBTQ rights for the NECC now soon uh, that's not official yet but it's getting there um, the by the time this VOD is out, I'll be official with the Voices of Intercollegiate Esports as Ooh. their, I, I am the um, director, uh, or I'm on the board of directors now for the purpose of DEI. Uh, I, you heard it here first, just so everyone knows. Thank you, knows, thank right? you. Uh, Eric, if you're watching, don't yell at me. Um, it's not, not official yet. Spill the beans, uh, but hey, don't tell anybody yet. Yeah, uh, I, I am also uh, a staff and faculty mentor for the Pride Floor at Wesley and the Dorms. Uh, next year. I'm starting that next year. Uh, and I've had some Wesleyan students come out to me. So it's just being there, being present. Yeah. Apparently means a lot. And I've had, like I mentioned earlier, I've gotten death threats. I, I've had nasty said to me, I've got called, I got compared to a toaster at some point, That's which so was odd. Yeah. Um, and I've also had people really come after me for my identity. And I it came to a peak a couple months ago where I was just getting yelled at for being trans online. And so I hung up, I hung a flag behind me yep. and then I got a tattoo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I really wanted to show that like, I'm being me as much as I can yeah. and that I don't care. I got these pride jerseys made um, back in November and they're not just a, they're not just a June thing. Yeah, They're a year round thing. And I love wearing them. And when I wear into events, a couple kids faces light up yeah. and they don't talk to me every time, but I can tell, Hey, that's someone else who I know can be supportive and I feel safer here. That's incredible. And, and obviously you took the role for director of resports, um, in like 2021 at yeah, Illinois. July. What, yeah. In July. Okay. Um, what is the, what is the day to day like for the director of esports? <laughs> Um, <laughs> it ranges, right? Because I've heard it so ranges, many different It ranges. <laughs> so on average, I'm in around 19, 15 to 20 hours of meetings a week. Mm -hmm. um, I serve, so I'm owned by the Dean of Students Office. I'm owned by Student Life. 
Okay. So that's all the meetings I serve in. Uh, I generally am handling broadcast, recruiting, financials, documentation, uh, my own students, uh, match scheduling, um, mentoring my student workers, coaching, program development, uh, broadcasting, uh, outreach. I'm our high school contact because it's my it's my my home world, mm-hmm. and it's my it's my home turf. Um, I also do a lot of community development, and so like reaching out to those spaces on campus and getting things involved like that. And I couldn't do it all without my two staff members, my two coaches, TJ and Lorenzo. Lorenzo just left us unfortunately. Um, both just do so much to help me enable, enable me to do this stuff. But also part of my job is being the face of the program outside yeah. of the program. And what I want to do is I want to show off my students more than me because I love going to interviews. I love talking because I can do it all day. <laughs> it was my job for a while, but my students come first. And what I do is always student centered. I have had whole days where I had to drop everything I was doing because the student needed me. And that comes first. That, that genuinely comes first and my kids come first and my kids, they're 22 <laughs> yeah. but, and I'm 26. Our young adults, you know, right? <laughs> yeah. But, but they're my kids. And, and I want to show my students that I genuinely do care about them and I want them to feel that. Yeah. Uh, so again, uh, for the chat, if you're here live on Twitch, uh, feel free to ask any questions. We'll pull them up on screen uh, and get a uh, core to answer them for us. The first one comes from Samurai Tank. Uh, she says, I would love to know if you have any advice or guidance for those facing similar negative attacks um, and how could they respond, whether to the person or even to those for themselves? So a way to approach this is this two different ways. This is, well, three. There, there's three ways I approach this. There's online, there's workplace, there's in person. Online, whenever I get a nasty Twitter DM, I respond Lamau and they block me. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got some nasty stuff. Uh, when, I announced, sure. when I announced my donation, I had someone tell me the Trevor Project is brainwashing children. And I've had someone call me a groomer and I've had mm-hmm. death threats and I've had all these things. I just found Lamau and they blocked me because it's Twitter. Who cares? Yeah. Um, and, and that's the thing is when it's some random person I never met online, I just show them that I genuinely don't care. Yeah. It's just them being being mean and I genuinely, genuinely, truly could not care less who they are, let alone what they're saying. Second, if it's in the workplace, I elevate that. Uh, yeah. In full transparency, I have dealt with transphobia at Wesleyan. We are a liberal arts college and I have dealt with it. Yeah. Um, there have been departments who have been very unkind to me. And there have been groups on campus who, they have known me as Coral and they've known me as my dead name. Because I was there from October to July as my dead name. And then from October, from then October to now as Coral. Right. Well, that's a lot longer. And I still call my dead name by several groups on campus. And I just elevated it above me. We, I have a office of diversity and inclusion on campus who I'm very good friends with. Yeah. And one of my very close friends is one of the assistant directors there. So I go to her. Or my boss is the is a huge advocate for LGBTQ rights on campus. I go to him and he's the associate dean of students. So he has bigger power than I do. Yeah. And when he waves a stick, you listen. And so that, that happens. When it's in person, it depends. Um, for example, last weekend, I, uh, so I'm going to some weddings in the course of the year. Uh, and one of them, my very close friend from high school is getting married to someone else I'm also friends with his fiance. And so I was getting a dress for the wedding at a bridal store. And I was with my mom because she's very graciously offered to help me with that because I have not a clue what I'm doing. <laughs> and what happened is mom told me when we got home, oh yeah, there's a bridal party there who was scowling at you the entire time and would call you disgusting behind your back. I'm sorry. That's... I'm just better than them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just better than them. One, I looked hotter. But two, <laughs> I, I like if they're not gonna say it to my face, they're they're straight up cowards. If they're gonna say it to my face, they're just a. That's yeah. the truth. If they're not gonna say it to your face, they are an absolute coward and should be treated with with disregard. If they're gonna say it to your face, then they better own that. Yeah. And if they're gonna own that, that's gonna that's gonna brand them for life. Yeah. If they choose to be hateful, they choose to be awful people, then they're an awful person, and I suddenly care less about them. Yeah, I have had industry colleagues talk behind my back. 
Also, sorry, I'm swearing here. It's okay. <laughs> I I'm sorry I'm that sorry. these people are saying these things. This, um, is, the, no, this is just would, the truth. Um, I, I would be in there ready to fight. You know? <laughs> well, the thing is, it's it's a lot about what's worth fighting. Yeah, and, very true. And I learned this from teaching, actually, is when a 15-year-old is is having a bad day and being pissy, it's not worth my time. Right. I have things to do. And that's what, that's what happens here is part of it, what I'm lucky with is I'm so busy. I have things to do. Yeah. I don't care. Yeah. You want to, you want to be mean? Cool. I'm living my best life. And the, 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 the proofs in the pudding, I have all these people who are here with me and here for me and I couldn't be more grateful for them. And I'm doing what I'm doing for them. Yeah. I'm not doing what I'm doing for anyone else. And that's huge. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy when that stuff happens and, and, you know, to, to be brave and, and doing everything that you're doing, you know, that's, that's huge. We've got another question in chat from, yeah. uh, the legendary Jacob is nachos. Um, and the, the question is what can allies do better to support the transgender community? Um, listen, genuinely listen. So, so this is going to go back to some anecdotal evidence. Um, so after I came out, I, some of my old kids, including the kids, practically my son over the, the high school, mm -hmm. reached out and said, Hey, can you come back to the school and speak, uh, to the GSA, the gay student Alliance about your experiences and hopefully they'll get some mentorship from that. And it helped the kids and the speech was good, yeah. but I, I noticed that the social worker who was new there, I had not met her before viewed the kids as something to be fixed. And it's, what are your problems? How can I fix them? That is not to, the way to approach it. The way to approach it is what's going on and what do you want from me? Because th th this, it's this whole idea of when you're trying to be empathetic with someone and something's going on with someone, you ask them, what can I do for you? Do you want me to listen? Do yeah. you want me to provide advice? Do you want me to be supportive? Do you want to just be here in silence and get a hug? What do you want? And even if they have a clear answer right now, just being there for them and showing them that you care. You don't have to solve everything. That's not even reasonable to assume. Just show them that you care about them and that someone cares about them despite what they're going through. Or just that you care and that you're listening and that you're not going to try to fix them. That's the biggest, scariest part is that they're going to feel like they're someone's trying to fix me. Yeah. No, I'm not trying to fix you. I'm here to be a shoulder to cry on and be someone who cares about you like that we've got another one from chat here uh from shaky wakey how can i go about empowering my community and becoming a role model uh just like you as a fellow trans woman i always wanted to do more for my community but just not sure where to start um so this one's hard because i don't know how i got here uh <laughs> Once again, I'm just a loud gay person on Twitter and it's kind of working. But what I do to be a role model is I do my absolute best to both be myself and show others that it's okay to be yourself. And it's kind of an if you build, they will come sort of thing where if you do that continually and, and be that person for someone else and be that support for someone else, eventually it'll be recognized and you can be a role model. There's no quick step to it. It's, it takes time. It yeah. genuinely takes time, but it's doable just by just being a genuinely good person. Good things will happen. I love that. Obviously there's so much happening right now in, in June as it's pride month, but, yeah. um, on, on Twitter, uh, it looks like, um, uh, Illinois Wesleyan university announced that they're going to be highlighting LGBTQ plus, uh, individuals. Uh, but also more of the announcement was that it's not just June and this is a, a year round celebration. So I wrote that post. Okay. <laughs> so you did. All right. Perfect. Yes. It was a great post. Yes. Tell us, uh, tell us about the ongoing initiatives there at IWU uh, and how the esports uh, aspect of that plays into it. Yeah. So right before pride month, I, I wanted to sit down and do some research. That's the first one I've been out as myself. Yeah. So I want to do some research on, Hey, what's this all come from where what's the what's the cause of pride month why is it celebrated what's the history behind it why is it important and then i dive, dive in some deeper topics that come as a result um one of them is the idea of rainbow capitalism 
Does that term ring a bell? Yeah. So for those who don't know, rainbow capitalism is the idea that corporations will say, we are supportive and slap money on it uh, or slap, slap a uh, flag on it to make money. And that's what I wanted to avoid with our jerseys yeah. was they're not for just June. It feels really inauthentic when Pride Month initiatives are just for June. Showing support year round is more meaningful than saying for June, we're going to in the one month where it's socially acceptable in the corporate world, be pride supportive. No, doing it even when it's not the thing everyone's doing is important. And that's why I made a point to do our initiatives year round. I have pride stickers everywhere. I have had purple hair at every event since February. (laughs) I write pride jersey constantly. Um, and I am being unabashedly who I am. And while I'm not making my program an extension of me, I am using it to show others that you are welcome here. Yeah. And that's worked because our incoming recruiting class has four LGBTQ students, only two of whom knew me prior to looking at Wesleyan. Yeah. And they got to know me through the recruiting process and said, hey, I feel comfortable here. I'd like to come here. And I'm not saying it's a recruiting initiative. That's not what it is. I just want to show people and want to encourage other directors. And I want to be that model for other directors to make their program also pride inclusive because it means the world to students to see they can be at home. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I think that goes and it fits so well with esports because I I truly believe that esports is a level level playing field and that it gives everyone an, an opportunity and a chance to compete. And, you know, if you, you know, X out a couple areas of, of who can and can't like that just, it, it defeats the whole purpose of what everyone's trying to do. And so I love what you guys are doing there. And it, it, the Twitch chat is a very big fan of the Jersey. They want to know if they can get one. Uh, uh, they are for sale <laughs> on our, um, so actually if you go check the Wesleyan Twitter, the, East, the Illinois Wesleyan Twitter, uh, IW Esports, you can find um, our jerseys for sale uh, in a link, I think two or three down to one jerseys. Um, if you need, reach out to me. I'll give you the link too. Uh, that's, that's my app on Twitter, the Rogue Cora or Rogue hash 6142 on Discord. And I'll be happy to answer questions. Um, once again, it's not like I'm not going to make money off the sales. Right. Actually, I lose money off the sales because what I do personally is I donate $10 per jersey sold to the Trevor Project out of my own money. And um, so what I did for the spring semester is I did 250 plus 10 per jersey and ended up donating 350. Since then we've sold six more jerseys. I'll do I'll do a donation for spring as, for yeah. um, summer as well because this charitable cause means the world to me. Yeah. And if I can do it through something that is actually meaningful, I will do it. Yeah, that's huge. Um obviously you've been already doing so much uh for the Trevor project and um, you know, you talk about your 24 hour stream, the panels, uh, do you have anything else coming up in, in the next few weeks before the month's over or, uh, um, hmm. I have a, I have a, a podcast tomorrow I'm speaking on. Um, so this is a concept I talked about at, with our director who I'll not name right now, cause I don't want to have her with this. Uh, but we were talking about the concept that at all tournaments for collegiate, it's partially also networking for the community and it's kind of a conference. Mm-hmm. Even when the, the tournament's just tournament, directors will talk every night and, oh, shoot yeah. the shit and network and talk ideas. Well, they mentioned that the idea has been the same for four years. It's the same topics, recruitment and funding, recruitment, yeah. funding, recruitment, funding. No one talks at DEI. Yeah. And so warning to all directors going to gateway <laughs> legends. I will, I will be beating that drum and I will be, Bright purple hair, nail polish, pride jersey, and showing it off because it is important. And more people need to understand that it is important. And this is where I have this unique in of I'm already in the in crowd. I'm not excluded because I'm already director and collegiate who people like. So time to use that on other directors to encourage them to be more pride inclusive. To my knowledge, there is no other program who's doing what we're doing for pride. Some programs change their logos. Cool. That's it. Logos mean nothing. There's this concept of performative allyship where you're doing this, you're being an ally to be seen. That is not meaningful. That is actually detracting. Being an ally is about being there for others and showing others that you care about them. 
a logo change means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. We hosted women and non-binary gaming nights throughout the year. We have a women's Valorant team. I have pride stickers. I have a pride jersey. I am gay as hell. Like, <laughs> and, and so I'm creating that community and I know not every director can do what I'm doing. For sure. But like I want, I want them to do something. Yeah. Just do something. Be involved, right? Like participate. Or just give me money. I'll take that too. <laughs> that works either way. <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, okay. So as the industry grows, uh, you know, one thing that we always talk about on the show is, um, you know, students that are either at your school or our school and they're looking to the world of gaming and esports after graduation. Um, what sort of advice do you give your kids on, um, you know, as they embark into these new industries? The biggest one is just stick your hand up. Yeah. Genuinely, if you just stick your hand up and volunteer for stuff and do things you're passionate about, results will come. Yeah. The reason that I got so far in IHSCA is once again volunteering to let me stop. Yes. Because <laughs> no more, please. <laughs> right. <laughs> basically, because you can demonstrate to others that you are not only capable, but that you are beyond capable, that you want to do things, that you're happy to be involved. You're not getting involved begrudgingly, getting involved willingly. And that speaks volumes. You also take initiative and you're showing others that you care. And passion means so much. And esports preys on passion, but that passion can be guided and used for good purposes. Yeah. And 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 you know, I, I love the what you said about volunteering until they told me to stop. It, that is such a great way. And eventually, you know, you get you you have to stop volunteering because you want to get paid and, and you got things to do, but uh, it is such a great way to get in the door and get some experience so that you can then go on and, and continue moving forward. You know, we And always... I made this comment about networking a couple weeks back as well. On my Twitter, I have a post below about networking because something I do is if I meet someone and they're like, hey, I want to do this thing and I know someone else who they'd be good to talk to, mm -hmm. I just set them up. Yep. There is no like, oh, I want to hold this asset for myself. I don't give a shit. Like, I'm here to grow the community. And yep. Case in point, I have, um, I'm going to call her out because I, uh, I love him. Uh, Leith over at NECC uh, is doing DEI work for them and also is at a college in New York. I got them in contact with Chris Aviles over in New Jersey, who then has contacts in New York to help them. And I got them in contact with my friend Freya over in New York City to get them help and get networks to the high school programs in the area. And it's just making this web of connections yeah. and helping others find their resources. Yep. It's really rewarding, actually. It's it is, and and a lot of times that comes back, you know. Even you know, talking about like, oh, I want to hold on to this contact for myself. Don't want anybody else to get it. But then when you when you do things like what you're talking about, uh, those people go on to be successful, and they have you to thank, you know. And so that's a huge, yeah. you know, opportunity for everyone. Everyone gets elevated uh, and grows together, which is is a huge huge part of all of this. Yeah, it means a lot to me that I can just do that. All right, I think we've got one more question, last, probably last question here uh, from the chat, uh, and it comes again from Samurai Tank, uh, and she asks, are there any discords or communities online that you can recommend for folks in the LGBTQIA community that need access to resources and community or support? Um, so there's not a ton of amazing ones right now. The issue is that they're, they're, a lot of them are quiet, uh, I would say, so I'm actually at my Discord right now. Let me go check these some things. Um, first one I'm going to recommend them is the Queer Women of Esports. You can yep. find them on dis on um, Twitter. They're great. Uh, they're run by um, GamerDoc, Lindsay. GamerDoc she's, is amazing. She, she's just amazing. And, and so that's a great community. Um, I'd recommend looking at Voices of Intercollegiate Esports more because I'm involved now. Yeah. And <laughs> I'm, I'm not to my own horror, but I'm involved. Um, and then so I'm really heavily embedded in the Valorant community because okay. yeah. it's, it's kind of my thing. Yeah. And I get really heavily embedded in the women's Valorant space because I am trans and I, I go there. Galarants is amazing. Hands down, Galarants is just the best place to be. I love them to death. And even though I'm not super engaged in there, it is the friendliest place I've ever been. Also, shout out, um, I am TOing a, the first women's Valorant land in the world uh, in Congrats. July in Columbus, Ohio, run by Esports Foundry and Esports Gear and headed by Lindsay Sumi Postal, but right now Bamberger. Um, and I'm the head TO for that. Perfect. And so that's a Women's Valorant tournament that's in person. It's a LAN and it's called Venom. I'd love to do that. And just, 
even if you need to find friends in a community, reach out to me and I'm yeah. happy to talk. Yeah. Uh, sh share where they can find you. Uh, shout out anybody you want to shout out. Uh... <laughs> okay. Um, you can find me on Twitter at the Rogue Cora. It's right there at the bottom. Uh, Discord is at R O G U E hash 6142. It's also my Twitter bio because I'm consistent like that. Um, email, uh, don't use that because it's boring. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then projects I'm working on, I'm doing DEI for NECC, I'm doing IHSA, I'm doing Voice, uh, I'm doing Venom, uh, I'm doing Wesleyan, um, and I'm just that loud gay person on Twitter. Yeah, I love it. And I think you're going to be doing the panel with, with us as well. Uh, is it later this week? Next week? Uh, Maybe? I did a panel right before this, actually. Oh, okay, perfect. <laughs> so is that out or is it already like, uh, that was aired? recorded okay That's cool recorded. so we'll see it we'll see it soon then yes, we will. um awesome well core thank you so much for your time we truly appreciate it and thank uh you invite. yeah absolutely and guys you can find Cora online uh but thank you for watching this episode of have game will travel the next episode will be on july 7th featuring big cheese k-i-t uh so <laughs> you won't want to miss that but we will catch you next time and have a great rest of your week